thanks everybody for joining us um, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to breeze through some slides and discussion around tree fodders, uh, which is very much a sub category and subtopic uh, within the broader topic of civil pasture. There have been some wonderful uh, previous webinars on civil pasture given through this series and other uh, sources online, um, which uh, I can point you to some of those. If you uh, visit the book website, civilpasturebook.com, in the uh, sort of resources page, you'll find some links to a series of videos and some guides by Brett Chedzoy and Joe Orfice and others who've been working in this uh, in this content area in the Northeast, anyway. Um, just to start out, uh, the process of writing the book for me was one of trying to pull together what we knew about silvopasture and articulate that for the general public and kind of identify also what gaps and, and new knowledge was needed. Um, and rather than get into too much speculation in this book, I felt like there was it was best to lay the groundwork and then look at those uh, emerging questions and needs um, that arose um, sort of after the book came out and, and as we continue to have dialogue amongst practitioners um, all over the country. And um, it's really interesting to go through that process and see where the gaps are. And one of the exciting things I discovered in the process of researching and that I'm hearing lots of folks express a lot interest in is this topic of tree fodder. So my goal for this webinar is to share um, some of the kernels, some of the seeds we might plant um, so that you know we can blossom into something, a deeper understanding and a deeper utilization of tree fodder in our, in our civil pasture type landscape. So I just want to presence uh, where I'm broadcasting from, and I, I like to preface any talk where we're talking about land by just acknowledging the land that I'm on. And I'm on Cayuga Nation land, traditionally, in the central part of the state of New York, um, right in between actually Cayuga and Seneca Lakes. Uh, I work, as uh, Kim mentioned, for the small farms program based in Ithaca, and, and also my wife and I run a farm in, in the central part of New York, beautiful area, the Finger Lakes region of New York State. But uh, this land has a long and storied history and part of that, um, and a very important part to understand, is the stories of the native people who've been here. And really any land that we live on and work on and do agroforestry on uh, has that indigenous story that's part of uh, learning that landscape, in, in my opinion. It's been really beneficial for us to learn and to connect with folks who are parts of these uh, these different tribes as we've been exploring what it means to live on land and be in land. And there's a map there uh, at that link at the bottom of the page here that you can, uh, you can look at, at least if you're in North America, and see what uh, indigenous tribes have traditional territory where you might be uh, tuning in from today. So we'll, we'll skip over some of the uh, sort of introductory pieces to silvopasture, what silvopasture is, what it could look like. We're going to really dive into tree fodder. So uh, my assumption is folks have some familiarity, but I'll just mention that silvopasture is really building uh, mutually beneficial relationships between grazing animals, the trees in the landscape, whether we plant them there or we thin out forests for civil pasture and the forages which are really in the end the food for the animals. And I'd argue that the role of the farmer in this is to be more like an orchestra conductor, uh, putting all these pieces into place and then orchestrating the relationship between these and what that often comes down to is putting animals into the space making sure they're not there for too long, removing them and allowing the spaces to rest and recover. So rotational grazing is really fundamental to any good silvopasture practice. And of course, uh, as I have experienced on my farm, um, this is a picture from Brett Chedzoy's farm uh, in Watkins Glen, New York. He does a lot of silvopasture on that landscape. We're, we're all familiar if we worked with livestock that any opportunity that animals get, especially ruminant animals, which we'll focus the majority of this conversation on, um, because a lot of the benefits of trees are clearly connected to ruminants, so uh, goats and sheep and, and cows. Um, anytime these animals get access to trees, they seem to go right for them. Uh, and so you can see the example here of this cow leaning over the, the fence at Brett's farm and, and trying to grab a few leaves off this tree that's just on the other side of the fence. And uh, if anything, this is good indicators for the types of potential systems we could be working with and, and some of the benefits of them. If the animals like them, there must be something to this at the end of the day. 
um, our interaction with silvopasture and tree fodder and specifically uh, really seeing the benefit and what really got me going uh, with thinking about and feeling like that silvopasture has a really important place in this in the current climate literally that we're in and that the changing climate that we're experiencing is is uh, goes back to 2016 on our farm where we had our sheep flock that that was the fourth season we were grazing them and we'd really worked on a rotational grazing plan but for the most part that plan excluded the hedgerows and the sort of scrubby edges of forest that exist on our farm we'd started to plant some trees um, but we hadn't really thought about the interaction of the animals and the trees and then the drought hit and you can see our farm here is kind of in the in the middle uh, to the right edge of this red bubble which was uh, really one of the driest years ever recorded on history we did some great rotational grazing in the spring that year by the time we came back around to our first paddock uh, the grass really hadn't regrown it wasn't long enough to regraze and we along with many other livestock farmers in the area sort of panicked we didn't have the food to sustain our animals on the farm which is something we really valued uh, having having grazing animals for and so we uh, we deliberated a bit and then we said you know these animals these sheep we have Katahdin sheep which are a wonderful breed of sheep for silvopasture they're supposed to like brush and browse and forage so heck let's let's give it a go let's see what putting them into that landscape does um, so we basically unleashed them into the hedgerows on our farm and they took to the quite readily and survived and thrived I would argue uh, for close to 40 days just on the brushy material that was in the hedgerows and in the scrubby woodland areas of our farm and for us it was sort of just a stroke of luck but we really realized that um, there's something to this because in the drought year while the, the pasture forages were uh, browning up and, and certainly not regenerating after grazing. Um, everything in the woods and in this kind of woody vegetation looked pretty much as it does in any given year. Um, that same year we also were able to put the sheep into some of our initial tree plantings on the farm. We had originally planted a willow hedge as a windbreak. We have a very windy site at our farm and it just so happened that those trees were uh, you know just above browse height for the sheep and so it became this wonderful opportunity to to again give it a go see what they do see how the plant reacts and we had great success we've been grazing this uh, this windbreak now for three seasons and it's recovered nicely uh, from the impact of the sheep they're not overly stripping the vegetation or causing really any noticeable harm to the to the willow trees themselves and we later went on to learn that the willow actually gives them not only a nutritional benefit but a medicinal benefit which we'll talk about in a little bit so I think one of the visions in silvopasture inherently, often folks think about silvopasture, they think about thinning out existing woodlots, which is a, a potentially great application, but we're really going to talk about introducing tree fodders, which, which really means creating a, what I might think of as an edible tree landscape across the, the farm. And not a tree landscape where the trees look uniform or where the paddocks look uniform across the site, but one where there's a wide diversity of trees and opportunities for these animals to forage. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, we need to come back to measuring our success in these kind of endeavors by observing the animals and seeing how they react. And, and what I've found is uh, the animals really want to incorporate trees and woody shrubs into their diet as a consistent feature of their diet. And so again, our role, I think, is to orchestrate that and and make sure that you know that can happen in such a way that also allows the trees to ma maintain themselves on the landscape. Because certainly, if we give them too much access or too much access at the wrong time, uh, we'll deplete that resource for for future grazing. Um, so as we get into this, there's lots of different words that come up um, and are and are thrown around around how we might name different things. So I just want to mention this real briefly. Uh, forage and fodder really have been used in many different ways but are generally considered different types of foods that animals can eat. Some people would differentiate fodder by its uh, being a woody species versus a herbaceous or grass species um, but I've seen in other places fodder being referenced for hay or silage or, or any, uh, any type of, of grazing material really. So uh, we'll call our, our, for the sake of argument, we'll call things tree fodder for today. Um, mast is really where a tree is fruiting something, and we could differentiate mast into uh, soft mast, like fruits, and hard mast, which mostly is nuts. So things that are grown on trees and then fall to the ground, or animals are harvesting them off the trees. And that's something we won't get into today. 
And then browse is a word, as I've done a lot of research, I found that woody browse and browse is often something that's used as a term to refer to woody vegetation that animals are consuming. So tree fodder and browse you know, could be uh, considered the same thing. Uh, it really depends on folks' definition and how they're familiar. But all these words have different relationships as we think about the diverse foods and forages we could work into a civil pasture type landscape. So with tree fodder, what I'm mostly interested in is the fact that we can bring in an increased level of nutrition uh, and uh, some medicinal benefits, arguably, from introducing and maintaining these species in our landscape. And I think, you know, at the other end of it, that, 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 that's what benefits the animals and benefits our uh, sort of bottom line as good grazers. But, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, what we see with tree fodder is really offering to the farmer and to the farm landscape is resiliency when we have uh, extremely dry years and when we have extremely wet years. So uh, we're, I, don't, I haven't actually looked up the figures, but here we are in 2018 and, and we've had one of the wettest years on record. And again, whether it's wet or dry, what I see is that the tree vegetation um, does best uh, and is, is able to, to do well in, in both of those kind of conditions. And so that's really where the interest is long term. Uh, for us at least on our on our farm and as we think about this. This is just a picture of our sheep uh, stripping our Christmas tree post holiday which is nice for them to get. You can see in the background there that um, one of the things we use our sheep for and we use their skill for is to do some woody brush clearing during the winter. We put them in areas that we're interested in having them help open up and we feed them hay. In those areas we use a bit of bale grazing to trample undesirable vegetation and put some seed into the soil um, and then Inevitably, the sheep, uh, you know, eat through their hay in the first few hours of the morning after we feed them, and then they go to work stripping uh, woody vegetation that we might want to actually remove or reduce in our landscape. So you can see some evidence of that behind them, and then we often like to throw them our Christmas tree. And it seems like uh, at that time of year, in late December, early January, um, they're looking for anything green in the landscape, and they happily strip this tree down to almost nothing. So as I've thought about more about tree fodder, and again in the book I sort of introduced it, and, and what's been interesting in conversations with folks around that material is, is to really sort out some of the details that are the things we need to consider in order to make this an effective practice um, on our farm landscape. So one is to understand better about the nutritional content of different tree fodders and how that nutritional content actually changes over the course of the season. Um, so we'll talk a bit about that in this presentation. Uh, of course, we need to think about how we're going to establish some of these tree fodders in ways that work so that the trees aren't killed outright uh, during the establishment phase. So what is the threshold for different species to be able to be uh, planted out in the landscape and when can the animals start to interact with them? There's questions around the tolerance uh, of different woody uh, and tree species to uh, grazing and what the recovery period might look like. It's certainly not the same uh, for most species as it would be with the grasses where we might say there's somewhere between a um, you know 15 and 40 day recovery period from a grazing event to the next time those animals can graze. So there's a lot of questions there. But of course the best species that we could utilize for these uh, systems is something we'll get into a bit. I'll sort of share some of, uh, at least from my research, the top species that we can at least get started with. Um, systems for uh, managing tree fodder. So uh, I would say on our farm and, and many other farms that are playing with this, uh, tree fodders play a role, but they're not a substantial role. Um, they're supplemental at best. So what does it look like to actually design and manage tree fodders long term and really have this as an integral part of the farm forage uh, planning? And then finally, um, there's a questions. There's questions around animal familiarity and how willing they are to eat something or potentially not overeat something which could lead to issues of toxicity. Um, and that's really a issue that comes down to animal behavior which we'll briefly dip into again in this in this presentation. So lots of things here certainly in the next um, you know 45 minutes or so 40 minutes uh, we'll just scratch the surface of a lot of these things but uh, these are the questions that ultimately we as a, a community need to answer. Um, there's certainly been some research done in these avenues, but there's there's a lot more that could be done as well uh, to to effectively get this as a, as a normal part of grazing agriculture. So let's talk a little bit about best species. Um, when I was uh, researching the book, uh, it was overwhelming to think about the hundreds of possible tree species that we could recommend folks think about, and so I took. Uh, the liberty to come up with some criteria that I was interested in filtering kind of the possibilities through. And um, 
By no means are the four species I'm going to share with you the end of this uh, potential list of good opportunities, but they're really good ones, I think, to start with. And the reasons are, there's actually, first of all, research for them as a fodder species and some good evidence that they have benefits to the grazing animals and to the landscape. Um, these species are highly adaptable to a wide range of sites and a wide range of climates, actually. So we're going to, we're sort of focused on the temperate climate, the cool temperate climate here in the Northeast U.S., um, but there's applications of these species in many other climates, many other elevations, many other ecotypes um, around the world, really. I was interested in species that were fast growing and very easy to propagate because I think that's going to be an important consideration as we think about scaling up tree fodder to larger farm landscapes. Um, if you're interested in carbon sequestration, then really what we're talking about is growing trees that grow fast. And if we're interested in integrating animals back into the grazing systems, well then fast growing trees really offer us the shortest window uh, of time to do that. And then, of course, we want to find trees that have other secondary benefits, whether that's as a marketable crop or some kind of uh, ecological benefit to the landscape or to the animals. So filtering all the species through that kind of uh, list of criteria, these four really rose to the top as having good evidence that, again, my goal in the book was to put what we knew in there, not speculate on what is possible as much. Um, although we certainly were visioning a bit for the future as, as working through this material. But these four species really do have a solid foundation. They have some good examples in different parts of the world of being used as tree fodder. And they're ones that I think are sort of turnkey ready for folks to start playing with in the Northeast. And we could summarize these trees, I'll dig a bit deeper, as, as having these different qualities. So willow um, being really high in biomass production, so basically producing lots of food for uh, for the food really, uh, for the uh, animals really fast, um, and offering condensed tannins, which offer some nutritional and medicinal benefits to our grazing animals. Black locust is essentially a tree alfalfa. It has the same nutritional content um, as alfalfa, which, if folks are familiar, is one of the higher quality, higher protein forages out there. Um, it's a nitrogen fixing tree, which really uh, is unique in this category, at least in this group of trees. Uh, poplar also uh, incredibly uh, high in biomass production, especially the hybrid varieties, and what I would say is more of a balanced nutrition. So where grazing animals will limit their intake of willow because of those tannins, uh, they could pretty much eat poplar all day if they were given it. It's, it's almost like the timothy or something of the grass world, uh, something that they can really eat and eat a lot of. Um, and then mulberry really um, has the highest digestibility, really high protein feed, both in the fruit and the leaf material. And actually, it's so digestible that it actually can be consumed on a pretty significant level by non-ruminant species, including pigs and poultry. And so some real interesting advantages there. Um, I could spend the rest of the webinar talking about willow. I'm just going to give you uh, a few examples of the ways that we've been working with it and really some of the benefits we see. And of course, this is not a comprehensive or complete list. There's other ways that we can value and, and utilize willow, but uh, mainly um, very hot, fast growing, high biomass. The high condensed tannins in many of the species of willow, there's over 400 species of willow, so there's a lot of variation within those about the tannins, and that's, again, something we could play with as, as experimenters on our farms, because sheep are going to, um, and, and other ruminants, grazing animals are going to take in willow, and likely it's the amount they can actually consume before uh, moving on to something else is, is probably proportional to, to the amount of condensed tannins in there, because that tends to restrict animals intake of these of these materials. So we could play with some high tannin forages in the landscape for kind of the medicinal dose and we could play with some lower tannin forages for more of that nutrient intake. So the benefit of them consuming condensed tannins, the research has shown that it both can lead to reductions in their methane emissions, which is really important from a climate perspective, and also really some effective uh, benefits in terms of parasite control, which is a really important consideration if you're managing especially the small ruminant uh, breeds. Um, of course, these trees are, are rapidly sequestering carbon. They have a very fibrous and dense root system. They can also be used really nicely in uh, sort of auxiliary uh, plantings that can uh, capture and reduce uh, nutrient runoff issues, pollution issues that go into our waterways. They're one of the first trees to flower out, so they become a really important pollination source for native pollinators in the spring. And of course, they have a lot of applications both for windbreaks and, and waterways, as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. So on our farm, one of the things I love about willow is you can literally just stick a stake in the ground during the dormant season and get it to grow into 
a tree. If only all trees were like this, we would be able to plant lots more trees in the landscape much easier. Um, but this is a swale that we put on our farm uh, to move some water around. It becomes, through the excavation work, it becomes a great planting space. We basically pounded those stakes in and established these trees. And most of them average about uh, six to eight feet tall in just a few years and are, are ready to be integrated with the sheep. That first slide I showed you of the sheep uh, browsing the willow during uh, the summer of 2016. Well, we planted them basically in in the spring of 2014. Uh, you can, uh, excuse me, the spring of um, of uh, 2013 uh, is when we planted them, and they're ready to browse pretty pretty quickly. Um, this is an example from a research project in Prince Edward Island in Canada. Uh, they were using these trees and, and uh, planting them as a buffer between the water, which is on the left. You can kind of see it through the trees there. And potato fields, which were uphill. Um, lots of nitrogen and phosphorus runoff from fertilizer. Um, so they were looking at the potential to uh, capture that and infiltrate uh, and, and sort of utilize um, these excess nutrients and can prevent them from going into the waterways which of course can be a major pollution source. The research from these areas found that um, over four years uh, a one kilometer long uh, buffer uh, intercepted you can see here quite a significant amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and they were able to track where that nitrogen and phosphorus was going. Now interestingly enough they were also harvesting this uh, parts of this buffer on rotation and chipping it and using it in biomass production uh, to produce electricity for the farm. So really innovative ways to integrate willow and of course this could be a material that's also harvested or potentially routinely grazed and would still have some of the benefits uh, certainly to nutrient runoff capture. So we want to really focus on the hybrid willows, hybridized willow. Uh, there's a lot of different varieties out there. Salix propria, um, this is Fish Creek, which is a, a subspecies that uh, has some uh, incredibly rapid, rapidly growing uh, vegetation potential. But all the proprias, which are really the osier uh, willows, are really good ones to start with. And often you can find this material really close by and take cuttings of it during the dormant season and get it started relatively easy. Now I don't recommend you start uh, necessarily just pounding them into the ground. I think if the soil is loose, like in the example of the swale I showed, it can be really well, uh, it can be really successful in terms of establishment. But often what we do with our cuttings is we start them in plugs and then translate them out into the field once they have a bit of a root system established. Um, another good one that's been referenced um, is a hybrid uh, Matsudana, which is sometimes called Japanese uh, fodder willow and uh, Salix alba, which uh, this is uh, incredibly fast growing. We've just established some of these on the farm. We're eager to see how well they do, but some reports say 10 to 20 feet in just one season. And you can obviously see very quickly that with the willow like this, um, cutting and feeding it to animals actually has a benefit to potentially maintaining some sanity within the landscape of a tree that can grow this fast. Um, with each of these trees, I'll, I'll share just a couple uh, potential good nurseries to find stock. So a couple here. Uh, on the list. The uh, nursery in Minnesota here, just growfastwillows.com. Uh, Vermont Willow Company probably has the most, the widest range of different species of willow. And then there's uh, the Blue Stem Nursery up in, uh, up in the Northwest. Um, black Locust, we'll move on to that. Um, really wonderful tree, lots of potential in the landscape. Um, now, controversial uh, species for many places, um, not a legal to plant, for instance, in the state of Massachusetts. It's on the noxious plant lists in the state of New York. Um, it's still allowed to be planted, still allowed to be propagated and sold, but um, and, and, and this is because it's such a fast grower and it can be seen as something that's very opportunistic that can spread across the landscape and if you don't want it there it's hard to necessarily remove it. So we want to be careful where we plant uh, locust. One of the great ways that we can uh, limit its spread is actually through grazing systems where we bring animals in because they tend to uh, consume and suppress any sort of spread, whether it's through the root system of the will, uh, the, the locust, excuse me, or through the seed. Um, but you know, nitrogen fix these are nitrogen fixing trees. There's lots of benefits to bringing nitrogen from the atmosphere and putting it into the woody vegetation or into the soil. There are benefits uh, to auxiliary plants in those ecosystems. I've mentioned already that it has a high nutritional uh, quality uh, comparable to alfalfa, so really valuable. Our animals love to consume uh, black locust, and we have to be careful about uh, giving them too much too fast if they're not familiar with it. Uh, the wood, of course, is is one of the fastest growing and one of the most rot resistant um, in the cool temperate climate. 
Um, and arguably, Brett Chedzoy, who you know, I work with closely, uh, says, you know, if a landowner really wants to plant trees and sell them for cash, black locust is probably one of the best in terms of the quickest return. Because timber markets are so vulnerable and the time frame for some of the slower growing hardwoods um, is is complicated, um, to say the least. So, so uh, as, in terms of a short rotation cash crop, there is a potential to grow locust posts, and people are doing quite well selling those all over the region. Um, good carbon sequestration potential, another early summer uh, pollen source as well, significant if you're interested in keeping bees to have locust around. Just uh, some examples here. Here's a nutrient uh, comparison between black locust and alfalfa. There's a number of different studies on this. Um, so again, really good uh, value for these species. And one of the things we found on our farm is we can uh, plant trees really closely. That, that tends to help the black locusts uh, grow into a really excellent form. And then we could potentially be thinning these out and harvesting them, some to feed to the sheep and some to retain as an overstory crop. So here's us in 2013, planting on about three foot spacing really close together, assuming some of these uh, trees would in fact uh, perish, but we had pretty good success. Um, here's one of the, the, the hedgerows in 2017. So uh, uh, these trees are over 25 feet tall just in, in four uh, growing seasons. Um, or in, uh, yeah, in four growing seasons. Uh, we did a lot of tree planting in 2013, and this is one of our test plantings that uh, has really put the proof in the pudding. We're ready to kind of expand this, uh, this kind of concept uh, across the farm. But you can see here the, the spacing has really been good to help the trees grow up nice and straight. Some of these trees are going to be better choices for the long-term overstory, and they're a bit crowded now. So this gives us opportunity to cut some of these trees and feed them to the sheep or potentially manage them in some of the different ways to, to regenerate forage on a rotational basis, which we'll, we'll get to in a little bit here. Uh, again, back to Brett Chedzoy's farm, my neighbor just over the hill in Watkins Glen. He's got a really amazing example of a established black walnut plantation that he grazes his cows under. They love to be in there, especially during the hot summer months. And Brett's uh, conducted uh, many harvests in there, thinning harvests of that plantation, and used those basically to fence his own farm and then uh, could potentially sell those, of course, in the future to other farms. And, and we find really good prices uh, for black locusts. We find that farms that are selling them uh, tend to sell out, uh, sometimes even before they've cut the next crop of trees. So a neighbor of mine down the road now has standing orders for for at least the next year for black locust. And so these are some of the prices just as we peruse online that we see. Pretty significant uh, cash opportunity here. And one of the things I'm working on right now is uh, sort of some of the analysis of how many trees you could establish per acre in a civil pasture if you assume that you're going to retain some for the grazing system and harvest some for these products. What are the potential yields per acre in terms of, in terms of income? So there's some great potential here. Um, for black locust in this uh, part of the world. And of course, for beekeepers, uh, incredibly important uh, uh, pollen plant, um, really similar. You can see the pea looking flowers on this. They're actually edible to humans as well. They're really delicious and fun to snack on um, when they leaf out. And the Hungarians actually really uh, appreciated black locust a long time ago. They were bringing seed back from, uh, from North America in the 1700s and starting to do selections and breeding and really realized the, the vast importance of black locust as an agricultural species. And they've done a lot of selection and breeding. And sometimes you can come across some uh, Hungarian locust, what's sometimes called, or straight locust. Uh, so they've selected seed essentially to get straighter growth because a lot of variability can occur in locust and a lot of it can be kind of spindly. Although I've found that planting close together and doing some initial pruning can do a lot to uh, ameliorate that early on in the process. But uh, Hungarian locust seed is, is around. It's not always the easiest to find. Um, here's a couple of nurseries. Twisted Tree Nursery does provide that. Again, they often sell out of this material very quickly. Uh, unfortunately, Lawyer Nursery, I need to update my slide. I just realized um, they're, uh, they've gone out of business, but they're in Oregon. They, they were a great nursery, um, and Coldstream's still rolling in Michigan and has some of this material available um, as well. All right, whoops, uh, poplar. We'll just briefly touch on poplar as the fourth species. Um, again, very similar nutritionally to willow. 
really high kind of balanced food source for animals um, very productive as well especially the hybrid varieties uh, and really don't have really too much tannins in them and so the animals can really intake a lot more of this material. What's really cool about poplar is it pretty much grows anywhere uh, when, when we start to think about elevation. So when I visit my folks in Colorado we see the aspens up in the mountains um, doing just well, uh, just fine and enjoying that landscape. One of the only hardwood trees that are actually uh, in those ecosystems as we get higher and higher in elevation. Um, and we can find them on the in the driest and the lowest parts. This is a cottonwood down in the desert in Arizona, which only gets periodic uh, water from flash floods and, and those kind of rain events rolling across the landscape. And so this is a fodder tree that really has application across some um, high elevation, low elevation, uh, cool climate, uh, humid climate, dry climate, this kind of thing. Um, in, in New Zealand for a long time they've been looking at and interested in using poplar um, as a consistent fodder species and encouraging their farmers to plant this in their landscape for really the multiple benefits to the ecology as well as to the grazing system. And so there's some really good uh, research work around poplar, uh, mostly not in on, on temperate North America, but really things that can apply here. And you can see here in New Zealand uh, an example of a pollard system where they're uh, cutting the trees above browse height. They're actually harvesting the poplar as a crop, and then they're able to uh, stimulate this regrowth and actually have a food uh, value for the animals. Now, of course, you can't feed the entire top. You need to continuously ensure that the tree is able to put nutrients back into its root system and maintain that. But over time, we can sustain these and, and harvest more and more material and feed them to the animals and have the benefit. So lots of different uh, species we can think about where they might fit in. We, we sometimes call the columnar poplars. These were ones that were bred to grow straight and pretty narrow in their, in their reach. Um, and so we have poplars that work well in there. We have aspen poplars um, that are often best for slopes and high elevation. Then we have the cottonwoods, which, which love uh, sort of extremes in the landscape. And so these are all species that we can draw upon depending on where we're thinking about doing uh, civil pasture in the in the landscape and um, pretty much as easy maybe a little bit more particular um, what's recommended is to take a cutting with a couple buds uh, bury it down to the to the second bud the bottom bud there uh, and and these do to do better with a bit of root hormone um, and also some potting up before you plant them out they're not as resilient as the willows in terms of staking although some people do claim you can live stake these out in the field and uh, the link there is actually a fellow who's very committed to getting people started with poplars and he'll actually I believe still send you free poplar cuttings if you go to that website and actually sign up so um, he's just passionate about poplar and it's so easy to propagate why not um, so again some nurseries here and I guess I'll have to update my slide again I apologize for that because lawyer nursery just this season has closed its doors um, but poplar is one of the easier plants that you can find some material online for and then finally, mulberry. Um, uh, really interesting with mulberry. Mostly the research has been done uh, in Asia, looking at feeding uh, leaf meal, leaf pellets, and also pelletized uh, fruit to uh, a wide range of animals, but most specifically poultry and pigs because there's such a high digestibility of this material. And so these non-ruminant animals with the monogastric stomachs can actually uh, get quite a bit of nutrition from them and in some studies there's almost half of the chicken feed uh, was coming just from poultry uh, from from mulberry meal and so there's some great potential here again a lot of questions it's not so like you can go down to the store and buy mulberry pellets or or easily establish this there's probably a lot of variation in the type of species we're talking about so this one really falls to the uh, need to learn more need to research more about before we really widely implement it. But we do see some good information in terms of the nutritional benefit. There's a wonderful website about a lot of different forages, feedopedia.org. Uh, so just kind of showing you a snapshot of some of the benefits. So uh, really good high protein um, and good digestibility showing up. And a lot of minerals showing up in, in both the leaves, leaf material and the fruit um, of these grazing uh, forages or fodders. Um, Here's an example of a fodder block. We'll talk about that in a little bit uh, in South America. So these are uh, established uh, for the purpose of grazing uh, and something the animals can move through and actually harvest. You can see most of the material. And then they're usually not brought back uh, very often because the trees obviously have to regenerate. So this can't be hit with the same intensity as our, as our grazing forages. Um, but maybe once a season uh, down in the tropics, of course, you could probably do it a couple times uh, in, over the course of a year and still be good.
Uh, propagating mulberry is a little more tricky, and I really recommend if you want to get into it to visit a good friend at Twisted Tree Farm who will sell mulberry trees but also is really into educating folks. He has a wonderful online propagation course for trees in general, uh, but he has a great article about propagating mulberries, and he did do a little uh, blurb in the Silva Pasture book because um, I just think his writing and his uh, um, his skills in propagating are just, just bar none. And, and uh, he's actually coming out with a book, uh, I believe, next year. Uh, which should be really great. Um, I think called The Power of Trees, which should be really interesting to read. So again, uh, ignore Lawyer Nursery, um, but here's some other uh, options for recruiting some mulberry material if you're interested in playing with that. So there's other trees that have potential. I've kind of breezed through those four. Um, these are ones that show up but have a lot more question marks and didn't quite meet all the criteria from that original list that I mentioned. Um, so honey locust is something that Virginia Tech's looking at and doing some research with. We visited uh, during the last agroforestry uh, North American conference and saw some interesting results from their research there. That has a potential, um, especially in warmer climates and especially on sites with um, with better drain soils. We found that honey locust in our cooler climate in New York up here and also with our heavy clay soils is just not a great performer. But um, so this is again, it's it's less adaptable than some of the other species, but it's a really good one to potentially consider. One of the ones they're working with at Virginia Tech is a is a variety called Millwood, which actually was selected to produce a lot of pods, and these pods are actually edible by the sheep. Um, suffice to say, you need to train them, and 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 they need to be familiar. So if they have never eaten a pod before, they may not eat it the first go around, but it has a incredibly high amount of nutrition and and some benefit there. Um, so good potential for this one as well. Maybe more selective in where it grows. Um, we were really excited about alder. Uh, we found though that it's really hard to uh, harden off the bark for many of the alder species, and so the sheep really are good at stripping the bark. And and so it's again one of the reasons that uh, that is not uh, stayed in the, in the sort of top tree species. More research and development may need to be done. So. Along those lines, just a couple points on this aspect. You know, we need to think about establishing these trees, and ideally, one of the reasons we pr pr promote more of the fast-growing species is because we want our animals to integrate and work with these trees as soon as possible. And, and the two factors to that are really first that the tree grows quickly above browse height, so we can control the amount of forage. If the tree grows slow and the animals keep hitting it because they can have access to it, it's not going to grow. It needs to get up above them and have at least a some significant portion of its vegetation above of browse height so it can continue to grow and thrive even if the animals are eating some of it. And of course browse height is going to depend on your animal. Goats being those most notorious for uh, extending the browse height to what they can do. Our, our sheep try to stand on their hind legs but they're not very good at it but I've seen goats do this for uh, for quite a long time and so they can really it effectively extends your browse height quite quite much higher, several feet higher into the into the tree. The other thing is we really need to think about bark hardiness. So we have to protect these trees while they're getting established and then introduce them to the animals um, at the right time because in a matter of minutes they can completely destroy a tree like the, my sheep have done with this black locust here um, with a, a couple unsupervised minutes and access to bark that is not sufficiently hardened. So these trees are about two years old. The bark is not quite ready for them even though the tree is above browse height. Uh, what we found with locust is that uh, after about four seasons, we tend to have the bark be hardy enough that they can, uh, we can prevent this sort of activity from happening. So, in our process of learning, we've had to let the animals in with the trees and kind of observe, and and it, it leads to some trees dying. That's kind of part of the research and development phase. But, you know, if your animals are trained to electric fence, then the electric netting or a single strand, if you're working with cows, uh, can be enough to keep them off the vegetation. This picture on the right here is actually where we fenced off the trees, um, but uh, this fence isn't actually electrified. They're just familiar with the fence. They're not interested in it, so they're not even trying to get to these elderberries that we're keeping them off of. Um, you can see on the left there we have uh, this is at the Stone Barns farm. Of course, a more robust and and also more expensive way to protect the trees long term. Uh, but certainly, if you're thinking about larger animals that may be brushing up against trees, um, some of this may be necessary. Although I've seen plenty of examples with cattle. A single strand or a double strand of that poly uh, rope uh, material is is often sufficient if those animals are used to 
to respecting the fence, so to speak, as we go. So, you know, that combination of browse height and also hardiness is really important. And I think the the other thing is uh, when we look at elderberry or something on the right here, we think about maybe other woody crops like uh, hazelnut. Um, those are going to be hard to maintain. Those shrubby forms are going to be hard to maintain with grazing animals because they're probably going to do a lot of damage. Uh, you know, elderberry, for instance, never the bark never really hardens off. It's a very soft, supple bark, and I don't think our sheep will ever be grazing in them, but it's easy enough to fence them out uh, when they come by in the rotation. So our next aspect, as I keep rolling here, uh, animal familiarity uh, with this material is really important. So don't assume that your animals necessarily are ready to eat something. It might take some training, especially if it's something unfamiliar to them. Um, and in that same vein, if, a fa if an animal is unfamiliar with something in the landscape, they may not have the internal regulatory uh, mechanisms in their in their gut essentially to uh, to make sure they don't overeat these things and so this can be really important it's important to dig into this a bit if you're not familiar with it I think the best resource bar none to really start to look at this is what's called behavior based management um, and Fred Prevenza's work through the university uh, excuse me through uh, Utah State University and if you go to behave.net you can find some initial fact sheets and information articles about this I think it's a really important aspect to this uh, Fred's work has really shown that animals want to explore their landscape want to consume a diverse amount of forages and that if we understand more about their behavior we can actually train them and work with them to eat things they may not be inclined to eat or to wean them off things they may be inclined to eat that we don't want them to eat. But it's all about animal behavior at the end of the day. And and in Fred's work and, and in the research work, they really focused on a few things. One is uh, flavor feedback, that animals in the landscape uh, have uh, sensory uh, abilities to uh, search out food uh, and to consume a bit of it and see how it sort of reacts in their gut essentially and that that leads into understanding you know how they how they may or may not want to consume that plant next time and so um, within flavors you know primary and secondary compounds are often talked about primary compounds being kind of all the building blocks of the plant all the basic things that we think about that give the animal energy a lot of secondary compounds are things like uh, terpenes and alkaloids and uh, and the tannins like in the willow here um, those things are often seen as potentially toxic but they're also what limit an animal's ability to intake something and so as animals learn to eat willow for instance they self-regulate and they should stop themselves before they overeat those condensed tannins um, and the more familiar with the animals the landscape the more familiar the breed is with this kind of activity the better uh, if you're bringing animals from a confinement operation or from an operation where they're not browsing their landscape and checking things out, you have to be much more careful about slowly introducing them and allowing those flavor feedback mechanisms to evolve and develop. But with animals that have actually been in that landscape and have that experience, this kind of interaction, this kind of understanding actually can be transferred to the next generation of livestock as early as uh, in utero uh, when the uh, next generation is developing in the mother and also through the mother's milk as that rumen is born and is developing their ability to eat and so um, if this mother cow is used to eating willow for instance she can actually share that information so to speak through the genetics through the milk through the flavor preferences that are developed that she can pass on to her young and what uh, Fred Provenza's work showed was that those offspring really developed the sim similar preferences to the, the mother parents uh, within the grazing and so it's a very interesting piece to this and it, it leads to all sorts of questions about how we manage and and keep these animals together especially during those first months of of development and finally within Fred Provenza's work there's this idea of satiation and, and I think this is a really wonderful thing and, and you can in addition to checking out Fred's work he, there's also some great YouTube uh, videos of him lecturing about these concepts but the idea of satiation is, is something beyond uh, just thinking about animals as you know machines that consume a certain amount of food and then that food that turns into meat or milk or something else right uh, these animals are creative, these animals are intelligent, they want to explore their landscape and they want to take in a diversity of foods and the more you spend time with animals and the more you observe this and understand it you can see how each animal expresses a different preference and that preference can change from hour to hour, from day to day and from animal to animal and so we need to be thinking about and I think ultimately to have better 
healthy animals in the landscape. We need to offer them uh, an interesting landscape to explore and to forage in. And this is really akin to, if we think about herding systems traditionally, where animals were moving across vast ranges of landscape and able to experience that a bit more. Well, we can bring kind of some of those concepts into our farms. Um, Fred's authored a couple books. You can get more into that kind of science of shepherding, really interesting book uh, where they followed French herders and really understood some of the, the patterns that actually can we can take as grazers and apply to our farms. We're probably not going to move our animals across thousands of acres of landscape, but some of the principles do apply. And then a new book coming out very shortly called Nourishment, which talks about uh, nutritional wisdom in the body. I think really important stuff to understand as we look more into civil pasture. All right, so next on that list, that laundry list of ideas, is about nutritional content. And what's interesting is when we think about uh, saying that a plant is nutritious, well, there's still questions about, you know, when is it peak in nutrition? When is it decline? When is the best time to feed or maybe not to feed? And there's some understanding of this, but we have a lot, uh, a lot further to go. So we basically, you know, we understand the biology of trees and how they grow and how leafy and woody plants grow, where they have, a, of course, a time of the year where they leaf out. They have a time where they're in full leaf. They have a time when the leaf is is senescing back, and that's uh, you know happening now. At the end of senescence is essentially happening now, but the start of that process is often sometime in late summer. And then of course we have leaf drop, and so the quality of food is different in these different stages of growth. And we we need to dig deeper into this to really understand. So one example is that we can think about stacking different uh, food. Uh, if we understood this kind of curve for different species, we can stack the food uh, opportunities in the landscape uh, differently uh, by diversifying the species that we include. So for instance here, probably somewhere in the peak of these curves is when we want to have the animals actually harvest this material. And so willow offers that earlier in the season, but also uh, loses that opportunity earlier in the season because of its curve. Black locust is somewhere in the middle. And we find that buckthorn, um, you know, even considered sort of a invasive non-native species, actually has really high food value. Our sheep tend to love to consume it. It's a species that actually has a significant amount of condensed tannins. And it's something that actually holds its leaves quite late into the season. So potentially could uh, offer a food source, you know, later in the year. Now we're not necessarily recommending you plant buckthorn, but if you have it in the landscape, maybe we want to think about managing it for that benefit. Um, so there are some databases. Here's an example here. This is a database from the Netherlands that's pretty interesting to dig into. But you can see here these samples that are in this database. Look at the crude protein. Um, you know, d definitely at its highest in early uh, early summer, in mid summer, and then as we get into September, um, uh, even August and September, we see a drop in that crude protein. Right. So there's lots of questions to ask here, and how this shows up in different landscapes at different times of year, different seasons. We don't have that data in these databases, and so some do tell differences, but most references that I've researched are, are kind of summaries. They're averages of all these things. And so the question is: Is this an average of multiple months, or is just a random sample taken at a given month during the year? But even so, you can see here, even some of these kind of so-called invasive species have pretty decent um, uh, crude protein amounts and, and have some potential to be incorporated. So maybe it's not just about planting trees in the landscape, but also managing the existing brush we have and using the animals as a way to control the spread of those species while seeing them and valuing them as a food source. And so that's a big question I have is, you know, when do I want to feed what of these species and what's the value of adding different species that we've researched versus you know, working with some of the existing species that might be in our landscape. And while we might want to reduce the amount of, uh, of persistence these, these species have in our farm landscapes, we, we could also value them. And then, you know, from an economic standpoint, you know, it's easier for me to manage a honeysuckle that's already there with my sheep than to necessarily rip it out and then plant a new tree. And so, you know, where are those interventions appropriate? What makes sense? These are all questions I'll leave, I'll leave for you to consider and for us hopefully collectively to um, to answer. Uh, and then finally, um, lots of questions. And as we've gone down through this list, I started off with what we know most. Now we're kind of getting into a lot of the gray areas. Like, what do we need to really dig into to really understand the application of tree fodders in the farm landscape? 
So the questions here, there are lots of systems, there's lots of methods for actually managing this and making this a substantial forage in the landscape, but we really have to, uh, to dig deeper and to really develop and trial some of these systems and, and share our information with others. So I know I can go out there on any given day and I can prune material, and on our farm we have plenty of material to prune out and to thin, and so I've taken the opportunity with some of the folks who've worked on our farm to say, great, this is an opportunity to thin out some of these hedgerows, let's do it when the sheep are in there, let's use it as a food source. But eventually we're going to get back to where these this vegetation is actually under control. And then the question is, you know, how am I going to manage it? And what we've seen traditionally in, in farm, uh, so traditional farm uh, eco, uh, what am I trying to say? Traditional farming practices, I guess, globally, is folks have managed vegetation for animal browse in these kind of three major ways. So one is pollarding, which is on the left there. It's cutting the tree or the woody material above browse height, assuming that that bark can withstand um, damage from the animals. This can be